Colossians and chapter 2. In our series on the book of Colossians, we have looked at several passages again and again and taken different vantage points of them, uh, different views of them. I'm going to talk to you today out of chapter 2, and we're going to be looking down at verses 10 and following. And I want to talk to you about the theme of made alive, made alive. You know, only Jesus can make us alive. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he's the one that gives life. And uh, I uh, had this privilege uh, over the past several days to go to Washington, D.C. and hear a number of people speak. And it was my profound pleasure to hear some of the most uh, influential people in government today speak, senators as well as uh, pastors and uh, people involved in lobbying for the things that are right, people who literally have access to the President of the United States and have prayed with them and spoken with them and so forth. And one of those people that I heard from this past week was General Boykin. Now, many of you have heard of him. Uh, He is a man who was known for his involvement by most people in America through the movie Black Hawk Down. He was a uh, a hero, and he was a man who was a leader of the Army's band of, uh, what were they called, Green Berets. He was the guy who trained those fellows. This guy was a big deal, and he closed out our time together. And since it is Memorial Day, I thought I would tell you what he told us about a friend who was a Marine drill sergeant. And this Marine drill sergeant came back from his tour. And as he got acclimated back into life, he began to think, I need to go out and you know find something to do now in the normal everyday world. And when he was out there, he found a job in a little small town in which he lived where he would work with a pharmacist. Now, he was not a pharmacist. He was a drill sergeant, okay, which is kind of odd that he would be there. But he was an assistant of the pharmacist. Well, it turns out that the uh, pharmacist needed to go across the street to the bank for a few moments. He said, I will be back in five minutes so don't you, uh, don't you get into any trouble while I'm away. Well, of course, as it would be, he actually did go across the street, but it was more than five minutes. It took him about an hour because of this, that, and the other. Well, while he was over at the uh, bank doing business, uh, this man comes into the pharmacy, and he has some terrible coughing from bronchitis. He was a regular in the pharmacy, and the pharmacist was, uh, pharmacist was not there. This drill sergeant was. And after he asked about what he could do for his bronchitis, evidently he gave him his own prescription. And when this pharmacist came back from the bank, he saw Mr. Garver outside, uh, standing there with his hands clenched, his, his face tight, And he's just standing there. And he went in and he says, what's Mr. Garver doing there? He says, well, he came in, wanted something for his chronic coughing. It's been tearing him up. He said, well, what did you give him? He said, I gave him (laughs) X-lax. He said, X-lax, that's not for coughing and bronchitis. That's That's a laxative. He said, I know, but he's not coughed since. (laughs) So anyway, anyway, that's what he told us about a Marine drill sergeant. He's Army Green Beret trainer, so you put that in its own perspective. Well, I thought it was an appropriate uh, way we could look at what we're looking at today. I want you to go to, in your mind's eye, to the realities that are before us. In Colossians, because in Colossians, what we are told is that we need to be careful lest somebody spoil us. It's said over and over again. Verse 8 says, beware lest any man spoil you or make a prey of you, make spoil out of you. Get not only you, but what is yours. Because if they get you as a child of God, they're going to also get your witness. 
They're going to get your testimony. They're going to get your influence. They're going to get what you have to put into circulation for God. So beware lest anyone spoil you. And, oh, and as we see this word, spoil, it will come up again uh, in this chapter. And so what we begin to perceive is that the Apostle Paul sees this Christian life as a, an enlistment or an engagement in war. We are at war. You know, we used to sing very deliberately the battle hymn of the Republic. Uh, we used to sing very deliberately, uh, march, uh, we're marching to Zion. We understood onward Christian soldiers had the significance. We, as a country, were known because of the, the, the gravity of our faith, the deliberateness of our faith. We're not that well known for that anymore. Around the world, we have lost uh, that influence of goodness. It looked like the Lord was going to allow us to reap what we had sown in recent days. And yet, uh, come the election back in November, we found a reprieve was given. Now, I want to let you know I do not believe a revival commenced at the election. I don't believe that at all. What I believe happened was a reprieve was given. And it's upon us now to remember the words of Paul to Timothy when he said, No man who warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this world that he might please him who enlisted him. You and I are enlisted uh, in this, uh, this conflict. And we are supposed to be uh, disentangled from the affairs of this world. And that does not mean the political issues. That means the fleshly issues, because Paul goes on to say, Timothy, flee youthful lusts. And it talks about go around with those who are uh, righteous people rather than those that are ungodly and unholy. He says we are supposed to be people who purge ourselves from the wickedness of, of, of the earthly and the, and the profane and the carnal. And we're supposed to amplify that which is good and right. And this is his marching orders to a young man uh, who was his protege. You and I look over their shoulders and we say, that's us. We now can be made spoil or we can be uh, uh, grabbing spoil, <laughs> taking advantage of spoil that has been afforded us. Uh, when you look at this passage, it tells us to beware, verse 8, lest any man spoil you. And it says, because you are complete in Christ, verse 10. You're complete in Him. And that was the message last week, all about how we're complete in Jesus. Now, I want you to know, when it says you are complete, you are complete. God doesn't lie. God doesn't exaggerate. God doesn't overemphasize. What God is saying is that if you are a child of God, you have everything you need. <laughs> it's all there. And that is a beautiful reality. Now, why he punctuates this is because these people had gotten involved in their Christian life, and then after a while, it began to kind of wane. The glow began to wear off. One man was talking about marriage, and I don't know if I can remember what he said, but he said, you know, when you get married, uh, he says, it's, it's just a big deal. It's a big deal. He says, after a, a couple of months, after a couple of months, he says, what happens is you find out maybe this is a raw deal, you know? And he says, you know, after you go on a little bit, of, you know, he just was telling us that this is the way people think about the Christian life as well. Because what you have is you get this glory glow. You get this, uh, this uh, angst in your soul to tell somebody else about Jesus. But as time goes on, you begin to lose the, the glow of the early first love and you begin to lay it down and not begin to and not, and continue to engage in your Christian experience. And what ends up happening is, is after a while, it all kind of goes fallow. It goes to, you know, just a seed. There's not any enjoyment anymore. And so these people had gotten that same continuum all of us are subject to. And, and what had happened was the devil, being as shrewd as he is, he comes in at the perfect moment. 
And he begins to undo or try to snatch away seed in the lives uh, of those who had been born again. And this condition they experienced was one from a double attack, a, a double assault, one from the one side, one from the other. The Judaizers came in. They say, you need to keep the law. You need to be circumcised. You need to be kind of Jewish, even though you're Gentile. And then there were those who were from their background, who were, who were just bought, caught up in mysticism and worshiping of the eons, which now they're calling angels and all of that. And So they had their old world pulling back at them. They had the new world kind of uh, flipping on its ear for them, and they didn't know what to do. And this is why he says, Beware lest anyone make a spoil of you. Because they were being hit on every hand. And because they found things kind of afterglow wearing off, it was easy for them to hear that. Now listen, this is the problem in America today among the church of the living God, is that we got lit up for Jesus and then we forgot. <laughs> we forgot how good it was. We forgot how uh, complete we were in Christ. This is why he said, you're complete. You don't need anything else. You just need to drill down and find your love for Jesus again. That's what you need. You need to remember how awesome it was for you to hear you were on your way to hell, but there was a way to avoid that. And that you, there was a way to be free from sin's dominion in your life. And so as we see him saying you are complete in Christ, he says that we need to be mindful that this includes everything we need. And in verse 11, he says, uh, it is in Christ that we're circumcised. Now, for them, this was Gentile people. They didn't have circumcision. And so he says, you don't have to listen to the Jews. The Jews are saying you need to go get circumcised. He says, you don't, if Jesus was there. You're in him. He, everything is done. You're complete. Don't go back and pick up all of the old uh, rudiments of the old world. He says, uh, you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. And that word putting off has the idea of laying aside some garments. You know, it's funny how we are about our, our, our clothing. The Bible says we're supposed to be saved people who are not fashioning ourselves according to the, uh, to the fashion of this present world. And yet we do that. One preacher said, you know, it was kind of, a, kind of an interesting analogy, but he said, you know, people forget who they are in Christ and they think that, 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 that they're something that they're not. And they begin to act like they're something they're not. And if you take the church as it is presented to you and me today, many times we get the wrong idea of what Christianity is all about. You know, Christianity is not uh, about us coming together and patting each other on the back and saying, you know, well, we're glad we don't do what they do and we don't go where they go and we don't say what they say. That's not what Christianity is about. What Christianity is about is about us coming together realizing that this is an outpost of heaven. And what we do when we come here is we encourage one another so that when we leave the locker room and enter the field, we're ready to do battle. That is the Christian life. And the battle is done in, uh, with the implements of love. We are supposed to be people who are known by our love. And when we realize that, we can begin to go out there with that kind of armor on and we are to be salt, we're to be light. Salt burns if there's infection. Salt, uh, salt preserves uh, where there's a potential of bacterial uh, decay. We are to be salt. That's what we're called to. The Bible says you are the salt of the earth. So when we go out, it's not, okay, I did my job today. I went to church. It's we go out and say, you know, I got my orders today. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to be light. Now, light doesn't put under a bushel. You know all of that. That's the whole concept. He said, I get you a light. I put you on the lampstand. I want you to be seen. In chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I, I want you to know the great conflict I have for you. I want you to know that. You know, the world in which we live needs to know uh, about our testimony. They need to know about the things that we have dealt with, the, 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 the conflicts that we've uh, fought, the, the, the failures that we've been experienced. They need to know that we're wrestling and we're fighting and that we love Jesus. You know, we go into the world and sometimes we want to make the world think we got it all together when in reality we're battling every single day. 
And we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers. And the battle is in the Lord's hands. The Bible says, I will, uh, upon the rock of the profession of who Jesus was, He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. You see this metaphor, this, this picture of the warfare? You know, it's all going to conclude with a war, right? It's going to be a political war. Jesus is going to come. He's going to break through the skies. He's going to come riding on a white horse with the armies of heaven, and He's going to shut down this nonsense down here. I need an amen right there, please. help me. Somebody help me preach, okay? Because I'm trying. I'm really working hard. But I want you to know that this is what it is. He says, don't let anybody spoil you. Your boots on the ground. You're the people of God. You're the army of God. One of the armies is going to be following him coming out of glory. What a day that's going to be. And we get so uh, inoculated to reality because we're comfortable. But man, I'll tell you, those people in South Korea, they're nervous. Aren't they? They're nervous. They're th- what about those Ethiopian Coptic Christians that got killed this past week? Christians killed. A bunch of children. I think it was like 10 children on that bus. ISIS is taking the responsibility. What am I saying? I'm saying we don't have as much of a concern about what's going on because it doesn't concern us. But in reality, people are perishing every day for lack of knowledge. We have to get our minds around the fact that God said, I have made you complete in Christ. I have made you before me, God says, unreprovable, unblameable, and holy in my sight. There is nobody who can bring a charge against God's elect, it says in Romans 8. You cannot be uh, impugned before God if you're His child. You are absolutely accepted, absolutely loved, absolutely complete before God. And he says so that we might be presented to the world. You don't just live for yourselves. We don't just live for ourselves. We live for Jesus. You know, there's a, uh, you know, I, I, I know a couple of you and I'm, I'm not going to name any names. But when you eat your dinners, you eat your, you eat your dessert first. And I know who you are. Because your mama told you that if you don't eat your dessert first, you might die before you get to it. You get on that. And then you can eat your vegetables. Now, I'm just trying to say that that's fine in your diet, but it's not fine in our duty, is it? We need to realize our dessert is later. In His presence is fullness of joy, and at His right hand are pleasures forevermore. David said, I will be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. (laughs) We know that when we see Him, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And when He says you are complete in Him, you need to realize that the reality is we are absolutely perfected in Jesus. Don't need anybody being, you know, chasing butterflies. Well, I'm going to try this. I'm going to drill after that. I'm going to go chase. No. Stay on point. Stay on task. There's a whole lot of stuff you can get caught up in. But we're complete in Jesus. And that's the marching orders we need to know. The Bible says not only are we complete in Jesus, circumcised, that puts down the Judaizers, uh, but the Bible says we're risen in verse, uh, we're risen with him in verse 12, uh, Uh, risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God. Now, I made a little bit of that last week. I'm not going to go into it again because I want to get you through this. Verse 13, he he goes into now. We've talked about last week more uh, and uh, amplified that. If you want to watch it on YouTube, you may. But I want to get to this second point, and that is not only are we complete in Christ, we are conquerors in Christ. He says, don't let anybody spoil you. Uh, But he also then tells us that we have been given a spoil. It says, And you, verse 13, being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, literally he's made alive, together with Christ, listen to this, having forgiven all of your trespasses. Now somebody asked uh, a preacher of the last generation... Uh, His name was H.A. Ironside. Uh, And this lady went up to him after one of his meetings and she said, 
uh, Dr. Ironside, it's, I know I've been forgiven for my past sins, but what about my future sins? And he pulled his glasses down in his imitable way, and he says, Ma'am, may I ask you, how many of your sins were future when Jesus died? He has forgiven all of your sins. And you're going to sin. You're going to falter. You're going to fail. He knew that. You know, sometimes my wife will send me to the store for some stuff. And I assure her I got this. I got this. I got this. And about ten minutes in into my drive, I've completely forgotten the list. And I'm like thinking, I'm thinking, I'm not going to let her know. I know this. I know what she said. There was only like 75 items. No, two or three items on that list. I should remember this. Sure enough, I'll get in there and no sooner than I get one or two things and I'm completely baffled. I knew there were more and I have to humble myself and call. Now, you know what? Jesus didn't forget what he came to do. Jesus did not forget that he came to save us from sin. He didn't go in and do just enough to get us a a little on our way. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And in order to do that, he had to pay for all of our sins, past, present, and future. And he being God knew every sin that we would commit and had committed from our perspective. He knew it all. You are complete in Christ. And he says, now you've been raised up. You're now made alive. You've been quickened. Now, I'll tell you something. The problem is a lot of us act like we're dead in the water. You ever heard somebody, well, I was dead in the water. (laughs) We feel like that as Christians. I blew it. I'm dead in the water. You're not dead in the water. He has made you alive. And yet one way to remember that is to remember he has forgiven all your trespasses. Now, there are different kinds of sins, right? There are sins you know about, what we might call sins that are, that are conscious sins, but there are sins of ignorance. You didn't even know you did it. You didn't even know you did it. Trespasses are the ones you know you're doing. You did it and you knew you did it. Now you say, well, boy, if I believed like you do, I'd do what I want. Yeah, well, if you do what you want and you do bad things, then you ain't saved because you ain't going to want to do bad things. I'm just saying, that's just a kind of fast thing. Now, I got it, I got it. You, you, ignorance, we don't know all these Bible verses, so here we are, we're little kids, and we don't realize, you know. Uh, we had the grandkids. I had this conference. I got back at 9 on Friday, and Linda graciously had invited all four of our grandchildren to our home to stay the night and be there till 4 in the afternoon the next day. But on top of that, on top of that, they all were sick. Not, you know, fever, but sneezing and, you know, snotting. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But it was what it was. And my one grand, I see him in the morning. I got to be all light and joy. And I walk in and I got my t-shirt on and, you know, I'm getting out of the shower. I come in. I'm going to give my hug. Hey, where's my grandkid? Come in. My white t-shirt. My white t-shirt. Hey, come up and hug. And one of them come up and just wipe that all over my shirt. And he knew better. He said, it's just good to see you. Gross. Oh, it's so good to see you too. Now what I'm trying to tell you is, is that he was old enough to know, but he didn't really know. You know, kids, they just don't know. And you know what God knows about you? You don't know what you're doing. I don't know what I'm doing. But what he does know is he says if we do bad things or mess up after salvation, it will bother us enough to say, you know what, I don't like what the effect of that is. I've illustrated it in recent years of putting diesel fuel inside of your gas engine. Yeah, it'll run, but it won't run very good. My point is, is that for you and me, many of us need to get over the diesel fuel and start realizing that you're not dead in the water when you failed. And you don't have to commit to diesel fuel. You can walk away from diesel fuel. The Bible says you are freed from sin. You are dead to sin in the book of Romans. And here he's saying, he has forgiven all your trespasses. That's how you know you've been made alive. It's not just your past sins. It's not just your ignorant sins. It's all of your sins have been 
placed on Jesus. He's the one who paid it all. We sing it, but do we believe it? Because sometimes when we fail, we think, I'm going to commit to the diesel fuel. Forget that. Walk on, brother. We are in a battle, and the devil wants to spoil you. He wants to spoil you like that spoiled milk that was in the back of the fridge a couple weeks back. He wants to spoil you so you're good for nothing. And the only way he can do it is, listen to this, through deception. If he deceives you into believing that you are dead in the water, you're going to act like you're dead in the water. The book of Proverbs says, as a person thinks in his heart, so is he. And so when you listen to the devil, you're going to feel like you have been dead in the water and you are under condemnation of the devil. You're not under God's condemnation. The Bible says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. But if you walk after the flesh, you will die. you wither on the vine because you're walking, believing what the devil's telling you. And you'll have self-condemnation, demonic condemnation, but you need to know something. You've been forgiven all your trespasses and he's put, he separated your sins from you as far as the east is from the west. He's buried them in the deepest sea. He's put a sign at that place and says, no fishing. He has forgiven you. Now that you need to know because we are not only complete in Christ, but we are also conquerors in Christ. The Bible says not only has He, uh, has he made us uh, blotted out, He's not only forgiven us our sins, but He's blotted out, verse 14, the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Now what He's talking about here is the, the law of Almighty God. He's going to explain it a little bit more, but you need to recognize that the law was written for a very specific purpose. It was made to, it was written and given and imparted to our experience uh, to get us to understand what sin was. Uh, The Bible says the law was our tutor. It was our child guardian. It was the reality that was emplaced into our experience on earth so that we might know what right and wrong really was. You see, if nobody wrote it down, you could say, who says? So God said, okay, I'm going to write it down. And you can argue with me all you want, but by the very finger of God, the law was engraved on tablets of stone. The first tablets were given to Moses. He broke them because before he could even get off the mountain, they were already debauched and messed up and chasing all kinds of nonsense. So Moses went back for another 40 years, uh, 40 years, 40 days to fast. And God said, you cut me out another couple tablets. And he wrote them again. Those are written with the finger of God. This is what's so significant about the ark. Everybody looking for the ark. But I digress. You and I have been given a revelation from God on those tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. Now, when Jesus came, we got a more amazing revelation from God because Jesus, chapter 1 tells us, is the manifest image of the invisible God. He is the express image of God. He's the image. He's the one who presses into that plastic bag. And you can see, here he is. He was really, really God. And chapter 2 says, In Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, verse 9. Look at that. All the fullness of the Godhead bodily. There it was. And when he died on the cross, the Bible tells us the veil of the temple was rent, the holy of the holies was exposed. And in 70 years, or actually about 30 or 40 years from that time, in Titus's time, there would be a wiping out of the temple altogether because God says, we don't need that anymore. Why? Because we have Jesus. We have the best. We have the fullness. We have the completeness. And the Bible says you're complete in Him. And you're complete in Him. And you're, uh, you're, 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 you're a person who's been forgiven. That's how complete you are. He's blotted out the handwriting of ordinances. Because why? Because you're complete in Christ. He fulfilled the law. He fulfilled it right down to the very letter. He never sinned once. The Bible says He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God. Here it is. In Him. You're in Him. And being in Him is a place you want to be. 
There are a lot of people who go to church and they do not know Jesus. Do you know in, I think it was Sweden, they just, uh, it was either Sweden or Switzerland, uh, they just okayed gay, uh, the gay agenda. The church. Now I'm talking about the church, not the government. There are a lot of people who go to church and they're wanting to hear what they want to hear. They want to hear nice, uh, nice little stories. But what I want you to know is the Word of God will blow you away. <laughs> it is so good. And it will deliver even the most, uh, the most darkened soul. It can deliver. It translates, chapter 1 says, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. The Bible says that there's not going to be any of these various people, fornicators, immoral, effeminate, homosexual, sodomite. They're not going to be in heaven. And then it says, and this is all 1 Corinthians 6, it says, And such were some of you. Do you know in Ohio we now have a law? That if you were a professional counselor and you try to counsel somebody who is caught up in the gay lifestyle and you try to counsel them with transformational therapy, you can lose your license. This is the law. Well, what should I do? I think you ought to just go ahead and lose your license if you need to. You need to help those people. This is a battle. This is a war. And people would go to church and say, well, I don't want to talk about politics. Everything is politics. Everything is politics. When preachers curb their messages because of tax-exempt status, uh, when, when the world says, send in your messages, we want to hear what you're saying. When we have people who are being put in prison because they won't sign a document saying these two people are legitimately married, and they would say, no, I'm not going to. When a judge says, I want the Ten Commandments in my courtroom, because uh, that's what we were founded on as a country, and the higher courts come back and say, if you don't remove it, you're going to have to recuse yourself not only from this, this bench, but from any practice of law at all. They're sending all the good people to the door. It's all politics. We can't not be sold in light. We're in a battle. The Bible says, though, we're complete in Him. And the Bible says that we, we have had our sins forgiven. If you know that, that's, that's huge. It, it's your tres all of your trespasses, he says in verse 13. Past, present, future. He blotted out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us. It was because it was contrary to us. God didn't give us the law to save us through the law. A lot of people think, well, I'm a good person. I'll get to heaven because I'm my good outweighs my bad. No, it doesn't. Your bad corrupts all your good. That's what happens. Man, if you're thirsty, I mean, if you're thirsty, it's hot. Man, you're thirsty. And I'm making you thirsty just thinking about being thirsty, aren't I? Well, you'll be all right. But if you're thirsty and I give you a big glass of ice water, but I take a dropper full of that stuff that was on my T-shirt. Right, I know. And I, there's more water in there than there is that stuff. And I say, here you go. It's all corrupted by the, by the bad. This is Christianity, we, we know. And the Bible says it was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And by the way, the law was given after Abraham. So Abraham believed God, we're told, and it was imputed to him for righteousness. That's the paradigm. The law was made to, interjected to get us all to the point where we would be thinking, man, I can't do anything right. Yeah, you can't. <laughs> because you're going to do something wrong. You know, it's like the guy who got this, this award for being the humblest guy in, in the city. He got the award for being the humblest guy in the city. They had to take it away from him because he wore it. <laughs> you see? We are at odds with ourselves. We need to know who he is. Jesus is the one who completes us. And the Bible says he not only blotted out the handwriting of ordinances, nailing it to the cross, verse 14, but verse 15 says, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it, in the cross. Now this verse is a very cool verse. I said we're more than conquerors. There it is. He says, don't let anybody spoil you, because Jesus spoiled them. They got nothing. He's already what? He's defanged them and he's declawed them. They no longer have dominion over you. The book of Romans says, sin shall no longer have dominion over you. Aren't you so glad? Jesus sets us free. Now we're dead to sin and we're freed from sin. And the Bible says, shall not he who raised up Jesus from the dead now 
quicken your mortal bodies that you might go and serve God. If you realize that He's made you dead to sin and freed from sin, you say, well, what do I do now? You let Him raise you up. And how do you do that? Chapter 1 tells us you drill into it, man. You just go out and do some good. You love on people. You serve God. You get in over your head a little bit. Give a little more than you want to give. Go a little more than you want to go. Live a little bit more loving than you want to live. And watch God revive you, animate you, and blew you up. Because all He wants to do is build you up. That's why he says back uh, earlier in chapter 2, in verse 7, you are to be rooted and built up. Rooted is what you are, but built up is what you will be. The one is complete. It's a perfect tense. The other one is an ongoing part, present participle, meaning he's going to be building you up. You get out there and do what you knew to do in the beginning, and you keep doing it, and God will show up, and he'll build you up. Now, this is a very cool verse. Let me unpack it for you. Verse 15 says, He spoiled the principalities and powers. They want to worship angels. He's telling them, don't let anybody, verse 18, beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. He says, you don't need angels. you got Jesus. <laughs> Isn't that good? That's just what it is. You don't need angels. you got Jesus. He spoiled the principalities and powers. And that's the demonic host. That's the devil himself. The devil now is simply on borrowed time. The Bible says that the Son was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. And the word destroy means render them idle. It means to put them in a position like almost like Han Solo in Star Wars. He's stuck in that, that block or whatever it was. The devil's stuck. But he still's got a big mouth. And he'll yell at you. Every day, you, you, come over here. You don't want to love. You don't want to give. You don't want to serve. You want to be selfish. You want to do it your way. You want to do it your way. You want to just pet yourself. You want to help yourself. You want to do for you. Because there's really only two players on the field now. Devil's works have been destroyed. Now there's you and God. You can quench the Spirit. You can grieve the Spirit. Or you can be filled with the Spirit. It's all up to you because you're free from sin. You're dead to sin. Your trespasses have completely been wild blotted out. There's no condemnation in the memory of Christ Jesus. It's up to you now. He's forgiven you. Sadly, what we've done is we've gotten going on our Christian faith and because we didn't know any better. It was months after I got saved that somebody said, you probably ought to read the Bible. You said, well, I can't read very well. Keep reading. God will make you read. You know what? I went to school and I had this biology class. And I mean, this guy, he would talk in symbols. I don't know what he was saying. And then he would give you a test on it. And I want you to know it was not my fault. I read the book twice. I prayed, God, I can't get this. I don't know what to do. I reached for a D. Unless I walked through my rest of my life feeling like I was a nimwit. A dimwit. Dimwit. (laughs) See? See? I still walk under that condemnation. But I had another guy the next year. It was in a biology class. I I just barely missed an A. But what I'm saying is, is that this guy... He was just so over my head, it was like brutal. But what did I do? I said, God, help me. Help me. And what we do is we say, I can't do it. I give up. I quit. I can't read the Bible. I can't understand. When I was a little boy, I took saxophone lessons. Saxophone lessons. I was going to be a saxophonist. And what I want you to know is that I only took them for a short time because I broke my tooth on my neighbor's head. And I told my dad, I can't play this. It, it makes my tooth buzz. It makes my tooth buzz. It didn't make my tooth buzz. But I told him that. And it was my word. And I never had to play saxophone again. And some of us are telling the Lord, my tooth buzzes when I read the Bible. I can't read it. It hurts. It's too hard. We don't want to follow Jesus, so we make up our excuses. 
My point is this, is that we have so much here. I've just told you a couple things this morning. Just a couple. We've only been here a little while, and we've been sitting here saying what? Complete him? Wow. Blotted out. Transgressed? Trans- trespasses forever? All of them? Yeah! How do you know? Because of all those other verses I gave you. He took the ordinances down. No, it's not about the law anymore. Stop looking at the law. Start looking at the Lord. And I've told you that this is what he's got to hear. You're being made a spoil of. He's getting you and he's getting yours, the devil is, if you're not engaged in the battle. And what we see is he says he made a... He took... He, he, he spoiled... Jesus spoiled the principalities and powers. So we're more than conquerors because our king conquered those nasties out there. And the Bible says, and he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He triumphed, he, he triumphed over the uh, principalities and powers in the cross. Because when he hung on the door of time, when he took the punishment for our sins, he did it publicly. Listen to me. He did it nakedly. Naked for you and for me. Everything that should have been ours to pay for, he paid for. He was bloodied. His face was marred more than any man's. His back was ripped. His heart was broken. The Bible says when they shoved in that spear, blood came out mixed with water. So the beating, the brutality, the suffocation didn't kill him. He died of a broken heart because he saw the worst that was in us. And he says, I'll take that too. And he drank it to the dregs. That's who he is. And we tell him we don't have time and we can't do it. I'm telling you, Colossians is all about us drilling into Jesus. And the Bible says he made a public display of them uh, in it. Uh, triumphing over them in it. And this word triumph and this word public display or this show of them, this word is only used two places. This word triumph, the whole thing that's built around here. It's used here and in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, Paul said, we despaired of life. We had a sense of death. Man, we didn't want to do this anymore. And he says, and when we went to do something anyway, you know, he says, we felt so bad. We had to leave a great door that was open. We felt so bad. We were feeling worse. We were feeling worse. We were feeling worse. But praise be unto God who causes us to triumph. <laughs> because he says, well, we got over there, some good stuff happened. Triumph. Your triumph is when you get to be marching in a procession. This is what this word was related to in Rome. When a conqueror came back, he marched everybody behind him in his train, if you will. Many of them were liberated. Liberated uh, prisoners of war. That's us. Paul says... Triumph. He leads us in triumph. He walks us through. We were prisoners, now we're free. And some are locked up prisoners. That's what's here. These are the principalities and powers. He triumphed over them in the cross. And now they have been defeated. They know it. That's why they hate you and me so much, really. They hate Jesus. They can't hurt Him, but they can hurt you and me. They get us hurt ourselves. And I want you to know that many people are doing that to themselves. We have heard it said many times, I'm my own worst enemy. Yeah, you are. Because the devil's got nothing on you. He can't make you do anything, but when you do it, you're doing it to yourself. I'm going to close with this illustration. There was a book written some years ago about a little girl who was age four. It's a true story, not like the earlier one. I don't think that drill sergeant really did what he did, what they said he did, but this little girl was four years old. And somewhere she was captured and they put a bag over her head and they ripped all of her clothes off. They abused her physically and sexually. And they took her to the deepest, darkest woods of Colombia. True story. And they tied her to a tree and they left her there. There's a book out on it called The Girl With No Name. Two or three days go by, no food, no water, no noise. They had used her and they had abused her and they had thrown her away and they had left her there to die. Somehow she wriggles out of this thing in her, this covering over her head. 
And she's looking around and she realizes everything's despair. And she just whimpers and whimpers and cries. And suddenly there's a rustle in the bushes. And the next thing you know, there's more rustling and there's more rustling. And pretty soon she looks up and there's a whole company of monkeys surrounding her. And they start screaming at her. And they start poking her. And they start kind of jumping at her and jumping back and doing all the stuff that would terrify a little four-year-old. And she just falls into a bundle of tears. And suddenly the whole environment changed. And now one or two of them come up to her slowly, lookingly, like monkeys are prone to do. And they began to show her how to eat. And they brought her food. They showed her how to take the leaves to get water. She hadn't had water in days. And for ten years, this little girl was brought up by a band of monkeys. She crawled up and slept in the trees at night. What they did, she did. Monkey see, monkey do. She didn't know any better. She would, she would pat the ground. They would communicate. One day she's doing what she did for those ten years and she sees something glint on the ground and she goes over to it and she looks into it and she jumps back because it scared her and she looked at it again and she realized what she had found, listen, was a mirror. And for the first time, as she looked into that mirror, she saw what she looked like. And it dawned on her that she was not like the monkeys. She went back to her life, but she was never the same. She knew somehow, some way, she would get out of here, and she was destined for more, that this was not who she was. Listen, this is believers today. The world and the devil has abused us and smacked us and beaten us and we played their game and we patted the ground and we've eaten what they've eaten, we've slept where they've slept, we've acted like they've acted, but somewhere, somewhere, somebody held up the mirror and said, this is who you are. You are more than that. You are this. And it changed the little girl. And eventually she came out of that tragic situation with what a story. And when you and I realize the world tells us how to dress, it tells us what to think is funny, it tells us what to think is important, it tells us what we, how we should act and behave and what we should wear and where we should go and what entertainment really looks like, I'm telling you, this is the mirror. And the Bible says he that reads this mirror, looks into this mirror and goes away and forgets what manner of man he is, is a man who is not wise. It says we're to be doers and we're not hearers only. And it says that now we behold as through a glass darkly, through a mirror darkly. It's like a dim mirror. And we behold the glory of the Lord. And in that image, we are changed as we behold. And God knows that this is what we needed. And the devil knows this is what we need. And so when we don't get in this book, we're saying, I don't want to know. And the devil will do everything he can. He'll give you another butterfly and another butterfly. Beloved, we are more than conquerors. He made us alive. And because of the knowledge of Him, because of the knowledge of forgiveness, because of the knowledge of the blotting out of the handwriting and the ordinances, because of all of the He's done in spoiling the principalities and powers, you and I can rise up from the ashes and go serve our King. And it is to that that we are called. Would you bow with me for a moment?